Since creating my channel, I've received an incredible amount of support from the horror community across Twitter, Reddit, and YouTube. I've been lucky enough to gain a significant amount of exposure and work with some fantastic people during my short journey so far. With that being said, I was desperately trying to think of a way to pay that support forward and help others who are beginning the same journey I started just over three months ago. I am Night Terror, and here are five up-and-coming horror story narrators you need to subscribe to. Today is day two since my wisdom tooth extraction. The throbbing is so much worse today than it was yesterday. Every single sound seems to agonizingly resonate throughout my jaw. Drip, drip, drip. Oh my god, that sound makes me want to ram my head through the wall! I've recently discovered a small hole in the ceiling of my bathroom. There must be a weak spot in the roof that collected water over time, ultimately breaking through the ceiling's drywall. I hadn't found it till I slipped on a wet tile and almost went ass over tea kettle in my bathroom last night. The pain medicine and my general state of grogginess didn't help things either. My mouth tastes absolutely awful. I went to sleep with it open and apparently hadn't closed it all night. Struggling to find my equilibrium, I roll over and spit. Nothing comes out. I might as well be blowing dust. I trudge through the path to my kitchen as if wading through quicksand. Each step is slow and sluggish with effort. The pain in my jaw is maddening. All I want to do is smoke a cigarette to get some kind of relief. Something to help me gather the mental fortitude to deal with this constant ache. In retrospect, it seems like all I've been doing for the past 48 hours is sleeping. I walk back towards my bed, though. My throat is brought back from its desert death by a chugged bottle of water. I am almost to my pillow when I see a dark, squiggled line jump out against the contrast of my pale pillowcase. I spring away quickly and turn on the light. Laying on my pillow is half of a centipede, still wriggling and flailing each of its legs. I loathe centipedes. Are they even necessary to our ecosystem at all? People say everything has a purpose. How is it even moving after it's been severed? More importantly, where's the other half? This is insanely grotesque and unnerving, even for a man of my age. I wrap my hand in toilet paper, stick it inside of a Ziploc bag, and then grab the... remains, and give them a burial at sea. I am exhausted from the consuming aftermath of adrenaline and panic. The bedding is searched twice, changed out, then searched again before I can find the comfort to lay back down. A deep but fitful sleep soon greets me. Over the coming few days, the pain in my jaw has eased a little. I can't tell if it's a sign of healing or if I'm just somehow getting used to the pain. The fog hanging over my existence lifts and I decide to indulge in a hot shower. The almost unbearably hot water is jarring, but soothing relief to my senses. My hands are halfway through sloughing the rest of the soap out of my hair when I'm incapacitated by a blinding pain in my left ear. I don't understand how I keep reaching these new levels of hell. Before this moment, I was sure that tooth pain was the most mentally unnerving to experience. Now I know that I was wrong. The splitting pain of an earache can be just as devastating, more so if you factor in the equilibrium changes. Why now? Haven't I been through enough? I shudder after turning the water off to hear the drip, drip, drip of my ceiling into the bucket I had placed underneath. I need to get it together so I can go up there and patch that hole before the damage gets any worse. Sure as hell can't afford to pay a roofer. Thankfully, I still have one day left before I have to go back to work. Management arranged it to where I worked ten days in a row, 
and then I got to have off the day of the extraction, plus four more after. Just to be safe, I give the dentist's office a call and explain what's going on. They told me that the lingering pain in my jaw is normal, but it shouldn't be affecting my ear. The pain in my ear spikes as she says this, almost feeling like a biting deep in the canal. As horrifying as it is, I can't help but continue to obsess about the missing half of the centipede. My mind runs wild with the possible orifices of entry that are held within my body. There are my ears, my nose, my eyes, those unmentionable, unimaginable places. Each option terrified me more than the last. My skin crawled with the thought of it. All of those legs. I can almost hear them skittering inside of my ear. Surely it can't have survived this long. The movement I saw had to have have been leftover energy and muscle memory reactions to its severed body. It's not the brooms in Fantasia. It makes no biological sense to have one into two and then have those two pieces morph into whole new creatures. The urgent care clinic is open until five today. They must be able to do something about the needle-sharp pain in my ear. If there's anything living in there, it needs to come out. Now. My stomach heaves. The pressure of the tremor renews the agony in my jaw. The core of my mentality does battle. Tooth versus ear. My foot rams down hard on the gas pedal in an attempt to quicken the route to urgent care. I arrive to see two patients waiting inside before me. Both are sag-eyed, noses aglow with the telltale redness of a cold virus. This is a good sign that the wait shouldn't be long at all. A gorgeous nurse emerged from the door that led back to the patient's rooms. She lightly cleared her throat. Kyle Gallopon? I rise to my feet in response. She smiles at me, shattering the illusion of beauty I found myself enchanted with not one minute ago. Right this way, hun. You're gonna be in room six. The nurse will be in soon to speak with you before the doctor comes. Her crisp scrubs swish as she leaves the room. I explain my tooth and ear situation twice. Once to the nurse, and then again to the doctor. It's almost impossible not to jump as he sticks the otoscope inside my ear. The chill of the plastic cover sears the inside of my head like a branding iron. Ah, uh, I see the problem here. Pretty nasty. The doctor shakes his head slightly. My voice cuts through the tension in my heart like an axe. What is it? Is there something in there? Get it out! What do you see in there? He places a hand on my shoulder to assuage my fears. You don't have anything in there but fluid buildup. Likely a response of your recent tooth extraction. That's a pretty serious infection you have going on in there. Let me look in your mouth. I open my mouth widely so he can peer inside. Bingo. There it is. It looks like you have a tiny abscess in your extraction site. I can see it clear as day. I'm going to give you some antibiotics. That should help clear up both the abscess and the ear infection. Make a follow-up appointment for two weeks from now on your way out. The pharmacy close to my house is still open, so I get my prescription filled. I take the first opportunity available to swallow two of the antibiotics and continue my drive home. Work will be here before I know it, and I need to be ready. My girlfriend Penny from back in college had two wisdom teeth removed. She was back to laughing and kissing my ugly mug two days later. It's bullshit that it's taking me so long. The next morning, I wake up in a new threshold of pain. The bathroom mirror shows the swelling of my jaw even through the skin. Unhinging my mouth like a snake, I lean in to inspect the inside of my mouth. I can see the bump pulsing, almost beckoning for me to pop it. As gentle as I can manage, I place two fingers inside my mouth and give a small squeeze. I can feel the give of my flesh through the pain, like a strained knuckle begging to be cracked. Then I feel something else. 
a jitter. It's slight and fleeting, but it was there. A sensation of shimmying, skittering creeps through my gum line. With no more patience left and my fear rapidly building, I jam my eyes shut and squeeze for dear life. My mouth instantly fills with a foul, rotten paste. I spit into the sink and refuse to believe my eyes. In my sink lay a few tiny, circular moving orbs. It doesn't take long to see what's causing their movement. Emerging from underneath the orbs lay two tiny centipedes, writhing, squirming with life. How many more of them are in there? Alexa, who's in my house? Written by a stony shore. I know. My friends insisted I'd made the wrong choice, and that Google Home was the better product overall. I'd pushed back saying I was mostly concerned with the smart home features. Based on the reviews I've read, Amazon Echo seemed to be the way to go. But as my friends pointed out, even articles that are a year old are about a year out of date with the way updates are rolled out. Whatever. I was happy with the gift I'd bought myself. i just moved into my first split-level house, and i just spent my first few weeks doing the usual settling in, getting unpacked, setting up my TV, and installing all of the smart home crap I'd bought. The upstairs-downstairs Echo Pair was the last edition because it had such a hard time deciding which way to go. But with the decision made, all of the unnecessarity faded into distant memory. As soon as I'd unboxed them, I got them set up downloaded the app, and began pairing all of my smart home devices. I began playing with routines, creating my own voice profile, testing the intercom feature between the two units, and generally just playing with my new toy. It was almost midnight before I had finally laid down and fell asleep, expectantly waiting the trip of my 6.15am wake up routine, consisting of an alarm, followed by traffic and the weather. I woke up in the middle of the night to Alexa reciting the news from the unit downstairs. The volume was turned all the way up, just as I'd received it, and I realized what a mistake it was to not adjust the setting. I went downstairs and told her to stop before turning the volume down. The clock said it was still 3.30am. Did I set the wrong time zone? Or did the time zone not sync? That didn't make any sense. Still groggy, I headed back to bed, dismissing it as a fluke. I woke up at the expected time, got ready, and went to work. Intermittently through the first day, I checked the cameras and thermostat, not really expecting anything, but doing so for the sheer novelty of it. As expected, everything appeared to be in order. That night, I went through the same routine. Yet again, the unit downstairs tripped at max volume and began reciting the news. This time, however, it was 2.10 a.m. I was irritated, but told her to stop and I reset the volume once more before falling back to sleep. The following night it happened again. Again the volume was at maximum. Only this time it didn't occur a single time. It went off three times. The first time I chalked it up to a user error. Maybe I reset the volume on accident. The second time I know I reset the volume. And the third time I unplugged the unit. I was irritable the next day and it was clear to my coworkers. Most tried to ignore my attitude but my buddy Dan wouldn't let me slide. So. Why are you acting like a dick today? Too many TPS reports? He grinned. I frowned. No, I... I haven't been sleeping well. You know I moved into a new house? Well, I got a smart home system set up and it's been glitching or something. It keeps waking me up in the middle of the night as if it's been prompted. I called the helpline and they couldn't find any reason for the unit to be malfunctioning, but they asked me to send it in anyway. He nodded. Did you try listening to the recordings to see what might be setting it off? I looked at him confused. Huh? What do you mean? It records recent conversations. Like, if you wake it up, it'll start recording. I don't know, maybe you have an ice machine in the fridge or something that comes on and sets it off. It's not common, but it happens sometimes. I blushed, embarrassed that I missed that little detail in the setup manual and excused myself. When I finally figured out how to replay recordings, my hands grew clammy, 
and my mouth went dry as all sorts of supernatural possibilities ran through my mind. The first several dozen recordings were all of me, playing with the features and were all clearly labeled. Then came the entry from the middle of the first night. Text not available. Click to play recording. My finger hovered over the prompt for a moment before I summoned the cards to click it. At first all I could hear was fuzz, and the pops of ambient noise, and the deep thrum of the heater running. Then I made out something else that was indistinct at first, barely audible. I focused. She can't do this. She can't do this. She can't do. Then the recording stopped. My legs felt like jelly, and I had to sit before I pulled up the other entries labeled Text Not Available. Click to play recording. There were a lot of them. Most of them came during the day. Some came at night but hadn't woken me. Most were the same. For a few moments it was just ambient noise. Then the voice began. I'll do it. They don't know. They can't. She did it. I'll show he... End. Next recording. I'll do it next time. Next time. She can't. I can't keep waiting. I'll do it. She keeps ignoring me. I'm right here. Waiting. End. Next recording. Tomorrow night. I can't wait. I gave her every chance to apologize. I can't wait. I can't wait. End. It took me a few minutes to collect myself and recover from the shock before calling the police and pleading with them to search my house for an intruder. Thank God they did. They found an emaciated man who contorted himself into the unused laundry chute across from the corner where I'd placed my downstairs unit. He was cradling a pair of garden shears and was mumbling nonsense when they pulled him out. We still don't know why he was there, nor who he is. The previous owner of the house had no relation to him and, well, I'm not a woman so I couldn't have been the intended victim. But that wouldn't have mattered much if he had decided one night to unfurl from the darkness and make his way to my room. You've just been listening to Alexa, Who's in My House, written by a stony shore and narrated by Onyx the Madman. Those who inquire of my occupation are usually more mortified than intrigued when I tell them what it consists of. I do understand their disgust, however. Working around the dead tend to make many very uncomfortable. Those who become interested in the business usually leave within a few months. The sight of sliced limbs and contorted bodies can frighten away almost anyone. But for me, this choice of profession provided an opportunity of a lifetime. I know of many who utilizes the craft as a cover for their many malicious attempts. Necrophilia, murder, cannibalism, and many others are just some of the activities this particular job aids in. I myself have dabbled in some of the more taboo leisures, but just like so many others, I have finally found my niche. You see, my particular hobby aims to benefit society and mankind alike. The constant flow of corpses makes it virtually impossible for my accomplishments to dwindle in my charity for this less than deserving world. I should have just abandoned the position long ago and let the world perish. My word, I feel like I'm rambling. I suppose I should further explain what my specific hobby actually is. You see, there are beings watching over us at this very moment waiting for their chance to rid the earth of its imperfections. I have, on multiple occasions, encountered these beings at a nearby Starbucks. Of course, garbed with human-like semblance, they ordered 
caramel frappes, stating that it's a delicacy on their planet. How they are able to produce such a thing as caramel, I will never know. Anyway, they have confided in me their need of a larger planet, stating that theirs can no longer produce enough energy to sustain their existence. The human body itself can produce a power source large enough to power a steamroller, and they estimate it needing 10,000 bodies a year to live sustainably. I guess suggesting guinea pigs on wheels was out of the question. Considering more than a hundred people die every minute, we could more than supply our fair share of assistance without the total alienation of the human race. Against my better judgments, I struck up a deal that I could supply the bodies they needed to sustain their planet as long as they kept their distance from Earth. I'm not one to show my affections for such an atrocious planet. With such things as memes existing, I wouldn't normally care of its destruction. But my existence on this giant blue and green ball has yet to come to its conclusion. If I was sacrificial, you'd all be doomed. As human, extinction wouldn't weigh too heavily upon my conscience if I were to cause it. Animal extinction, on the other hand, would be a tragedy. Oh my, seems I'm rambling again. Where was I? I suppose a status update of my progression would suffice. For a while, I was able to keep up with a steady number of desired corpses, constantly convincing loved ones of the deceased to opt for cremations or closed caskets. Curious minds often threatened to end my charitable donations to our alien overlords, but a large enough payoff usually kept them quiet. After a while, their need for human cadavers increased as they began the industrialization of their society, claiming it to be inspired by our civilization. It became increasingly difficult to keep up my end of the deal, forcing me to resort to drastic measures. Do you know how incredibly embarrassing it is to defile freshly closed graves? I felt like a grave robber without a sense of morality left in their body. It's incredibly demeaning. I quickly discovered that even after working nearly an entire night, I could only recover about five bodies a day. Eight if I cut out lunch breaks. That delicious pastrami on rye would just have to wait until I returned home. Having to pay others to do the job for me was even more humiliating. I felt like a pimp for a chain of ghost bride operations. I suppose I sound a bit condescending, but I'm sure you'd feel the same if the world's safety was at your hands. I've even had to resort to stealing bodies from other local funeral homes or paying off those in different cities to deliver them to me. As the progression of their society expanded, my workload doubled, and soon the demand swelled more than the supply. I was able to convince many to take part in my daily donations, but again found it difficult to keep up my end of the bargain. Fortunately for me, there are those desperate enough to do almost anything for a payoff, and I'm more than willing to offer up the dough. Murder, from many viewpoints, can be viewed as either a positive or a negative, depending on its context. If someone murders a pedophile or a rapist, who is really the criminal? Does anyone really bat an eye if the bad guy in an action film dies unexpectedly? Sometimes, to do what is right, the wrong path must be followed. And in order to protect the world, sacrifices 
must be made. There are more than enough troubled minds out there willing to take an innocent life, many participating just for a cheap thrill. I myself am not opposed to the sacrifice of a few to save the many, and I'm not against taking part in the bloodshed. The sliver of guilt you feel when taking someone's life is damaging at the very least, but you quickly learn to get over it. Their horrid screams become muffled by your desire to survive and your thirst for a continued existence. There are at least 150 serial killers at any given time, and it's safe to say 50% of that population works for me. We have, so far, been able to keep up with the demand those insufferable beings command. But as the amount continues to grow, we grow more and more desperate. The private residence of common citizens becomes a breeding ground for potential donations. Controlled arsons and carefully placed clues allow us to keep just beyond the detection of the authorities and keep us from getting caught. Despite what you may think of me, dear reader, I'm sure deep down you approve of my actions. After all this largely benefits you as well. It's true that I began this deal under selfish intents, but I believe if anyone's life was in jeopardy, they'd go down the same road I did. I never really planned on conversing this information to anyone, let alone a total stranger. But as I've stated before, I am extremely desperate. As of now, we are in dire need of volunteers for sacrifices. We know this is a lot to ask, but our local wells are starting to dry up, and we refuse to kill any children. We do have morals. If we cannot attain our end of the bargain, then I don't know how much longer we'll have to live. Some called it a plague, others a curse. A few blamed it on possession, but no matter what name it went by, it struck fear into the hearts of everyone in my small town. It started when I was just 14, growing up in a small town that my parents had been raised in before me. I remember the big, empty houses and the grassy fields the little creek I'd play at down near the Miller's farm. I also remember my best friend, Dahlia. She was small and wispy, always soft-spoken. I was one of the only people she really talked to. We'd explore the old houses, play in the fields, and the river. One of my most vivid memories is of the morning I walked to her house, surprised to be greeted by a man in a white coat rather than Dahlia's parents. He told me she was sick, that she wouldn't be able to get out of bed today. Her mother heard my voice at the door and invited me in to see her. Dahlia didn't look sick. I asked her how she was feeling and she told me she just felt a little numb, mostly in her legs. Her mother stood at the door, looking concerned. Poor thing, I heard her mumble multiple times. I stayed in that room all day telling Dahlia stories and playing games with her to keep her entertained while she was confined to her bed. As I was leaving that night, I heard the man in the coat say something to Dahlia's mother. I can't remember the exact wording, but it was along the lines of, numbness is the first symptom. That unsettled me, but I trusted that whatever illness she had could be treated. A few days passed, and Dahlia only seemed to get worse. On the first day, she'd been sitting up and moving around, able to retrieve her water from her nightstand or pull the cord on her lamp. Now, she told me her limbs felt too heavy to do those things and asked me to help her with them. Of course, I didn't mind. She was my best friend, but 
I was getting increasingly concerned. A week had passed, and she continued to get weaker. One day, I remember visiting her, only to be confused as she refused to look at me. When I asked her about it, she stiffly replied, I can't. I tried to tell the man in the white coat about this, as I assumed he was a doctor, but he dismissed me. I barely slept that night. I was consumed completely by my fears. My mind buzzed with what I thought were the worst case scenarios. Unfortunately, none of them came true. What happened to Dahlia was much worse than anything I could come up with. When I arrived that next day, her mother was weeping, the white-coated man trying to console her. I asked what was wrong. He said the first phase was complete. Distraught, I ran into Dahlia's room to check on her. Her eyes darted towards me, and the corners of her lips curled slightly. Good morning, Dahlia, I said. I've been worried. How are you? She didn't reply just gazed at me with her big blue eyes. I approached her and her eyes followed, but she didn't move, nor did she speak. It was then I realized what had happened. She was completely paralyzed. The stiffness of her words and her numb limbs had all been leading to this. She was frozen, unable to do so much as call for help or speak to me. I've never been one to cry, but I couldn't help it that day. I could see concern and unspoken comforts in her eyes. Filled with despair, I ran out to confront Dahlia's mother and the man in the coat. Why didn't you help her? I shouted at them, tears still running down my face. I thought you could do something. I'm sorry, son. We tried everything but we don't think she's going to recover. After all these years, those words are still clear in my mind. I've only seen this once before, and this is just the first stage. A physical stiffness, then paralysis. Next, the affected becomes emotionally numb, then internally. I was heartbroken. My best friend would be gone in a matter of days. After hearing the news, I ran home to my brother. He'd known Dahlia, but was far from as close to her as I was. Though, in those next few days, he came with me to see her. He comforted me as the light faded from her eyes, held me when her heart stopped beating. As long as I live, I know I'll never be able to forget the immediate dread that fell upon me when I went to check for a pulse that was no longer there. My brother told Dahlia's mother, and the three of us mourned the loss of this sweet girl who'd had so much to live for. The doctors didn't mourn with us. He had to rush home. I'm feeling a little odd, was all he said before taking off. The day after Dahlia's funeral, as I read the weekly newspaper with tired eyes, I saw a small memorial on the last page. Not for Dahlia, but for the doctor. It said he'd been killed by a mysterious disease, causing paralysis. I showed my brother and Dahlia's mother, and we immediately were afraid that we'd caught whatever she had. Strangely enough, none of our names appeared in the obituaries during the string of deaths that plagued our town in the days before and after Dahlia's. They were all loosely connected. The miller's daughter was one, the young newspaper boy another. As soon as we had enough money pulled together, my family and Dahlia's mother moved as far away from that town as possible. Ten years later, We've never seen another record of this disease, much less heard about it in the media. Our town was covered up as if it didn't exist anymore. I'm writing this in the hopes of finding someone who can explain what caused this awful plague and why it had to take away sweet Dahlia. I still see the pleading look in her eyes as she gazed at me from her bed when I tried to sleep. 
I still see the emptiness that replaced it in the days that followed. And I still see the doctor injecting her with the strange syringes from my vantage point inside her closet. I heard his laugh, saw his devilish smile, heard his phone calls to a mysterious partner discussing their next target, and lastly, I remember the look on his face as I injected him with his own murder weapon the day Dahlia died. I heard his cursing, watched his hasty depart, and smiled at his obituary. My True Break and Horror Story by you, Blade Xer. Hey guys, I would just like to share with you something chilling that happened to me three months ago. Enjoy. This is a story of something that happened to me and will forever haunt me. I'm 14 years old and I live in South Africa, which is a place where crime is very common. Occasionally I hear gunshots outside my house, but that is something that is normal here. I live in a big house with security cameras everywhere and motion detectors. My family's home has two gates, just as a safety precaution. Power outages are also normal in South Africa because of our corrupt government. Anyway, I was sitting and eating dinner with my family when my brother asked me, Hey, did you hear that? I replied, no. He went on to say that he heard something break outside on our patio, like a wine bottle or glass or something. Since I'm not paranoid like him, I finished eating and went to go study for my exam and sat on the couch in our living room. My parents announced that they were going to the gym, as they do on Saturday nights. So I said goodbye to them and carried on working. As I was working, I heard a crash from outside, near the patio. Like my brother said, what happened next sends shivers down my spine to this day. My brother walked into the living room, looking panicked. I'd never seen him so scared in my life before. He sat down next to me and stared at me for about 10 seconds with a look of complete and utter fear, his eyes wide open. W what's wrong? I stuttered. Upstairs, now, he exclaimed while grabbing my arm viciously. What the hell is going on? I asked once we were upstairs. He didn't answer. He just stared, winding the shutter down. The shutter is a large door that connects the downstairs to the upstairs. We are only supposed to use the shutter in emergencies, as it's made of a strong metal that is hard for an intruder to break through. He then ushered me to his room, the third story of our house which overlooks the garden and patio. Putting a single finger over his mouth to shush me, he pointed to what looked like a dark figure by our patio. At first, it looked like a long shrub, but as I adjusted and focused my eyes, I had to stop myself from shrieking. The realization made my bones feel like lead and my blood feel colder than ice. A man holding a broken wine bottle was pacing around. He looked about five foot nine with a shaggy beard. That's not what scared me the most about him. His eyes were wide open and he was smiling. A smile so sinister and crazed, he looked as if he'd just been let out of a mental institute. Who is he? I started saying. Bad mistake. The man turned to us and looked directly into my eyes with that same agonizing crazed look that gave me goosebumps. He then started to run, a slow staggering run that made him look injured. Towards the door to the inside of the house he went, and I was sure he was coming for us. I was so shaken up, I could hardly breathe, and so was my brother, and without a word he took my hand and headed to my room on the second floor. Since I'm his little sister, he always considered me his responsibility, so he held my hand and told me everything was going to be okay, even though I knew inside me that it wasn't. Just then, we heard slow, clapping footsteps coming up the stairs. The shutter was closed so he wouldn't be able to get to us. Then, at just the right time, the power cut, leaving my brother and I in darkness. But my brother stumbled around and closed my door, locking it. He then explained to me that without the power, the shutters can be easily pried open. I thought for sure that my life was going to end soon. 
Next, I heard an excruciating sound that sounded like the shutters being forced open, and I headed for my drawer to get my hunting knife that I had received as a birthday gift. In my right hand, I clutched my knife, and in the other, I held my brother's hand. Suddenly, the sound of the shutters opening stopped. What replaced it was the sound of something metal, presumably a knife scraping up against my bedroom door. We sat there, shaking, not knowing what to do, when I asked my brother if he had his phone on him, and he stated that he had already called 112, which is our 911, but we both knew that the 112 squad would take a long time to come, since here in South Africa, they usually hang out at McDonald's instead of coming for their duties. The scraping at the door continued for what seemed like ages. Seconds felt like minutes, and then my brother made me hide in my cupboard and hand him my hunting knife. With my heart racing and palms sweaty, I heard the sound of police vehicles outside, and my brother used the gate remote to open up for them. They rushed in and captured the man. The police told us the man had been on the run from the local asylum for the past three months and had been charged with manslaughter two times before he was sent to the mental institute. If my brother hadn't been there to help me, God knows what would have happened to me. I hope the man is recovering and that he is getting all the help he needs. Thanks for hearing my story. I just wanted to share the horror so that you guys can get a feel of how nightmarish that day was. This was by far the most scary thing that's ever happened to me before. Sometimes, in my dreams, I still hear the sound of the knife scraping against my door. I'd like to thank all of the narrators that took part in today's video. MD Who Entertainment, Onyx the Madman, Gothic Rose, Disturbed K, and finally, Monsters in My Mind. I'll leave links to their YouTube channel and Twitter accounts below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, stay safe.